<laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Abby. I appreciate it. So, you know, when this came about, obviously I was happy to do it based on what I do every day and what the magazine is. To give a little background on the magazine, Leaders itself is in its 45th year of existence. I've been a part of it for over 30 years. And it was really created to be a forum for government, business, academic, others in leadership positions to have dialogue, converse around different topics. For the first, I would say 10 to 15 years, it was primarily bylined articles. And what we found was uh, they were very, single focus, they were a little bit promotional in the way they were written, and they didn't really dive into what we wanted to be, which was really the place where you would understand issues around leadership. So we changed the interview format where now almost all of the content would be Q&A interviews with those leaders, whether it be uh, business leaders, to uh, large companies, entrepreneurs, uh, those in foundations, we're doing a lot more there around purpose and, 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 and the work around community and society. And for me, you know, in doing probably uh, 80 or so interviews a quarter, so I'm doing probably about 300, 350 a year, um, you know, I start with a very basic belief that many of the people that I'm interviewing, no matter what level they're at, uh, does not mean that they are comfortable being interviewed. So there is at the beginning of any relationship and any, any interview, my focus is how do I make them comfortable? How do I make them feel that, that they are going to be portrayed the right way? It's their words. We partly do that by sending the pieces when they're final and laid out back to those leaders to review, rarely do they make changes unless something timely happened, but it gives them a comfort because really one fundamental purpose of the magazine came out of many CEOs and others who had told our founder originally that while they might be interviewed, many times they felt they were not portrayed in what they meant and they were taking snippets or pieces which really lost the meaning of what they were saying. So our focus and the, and the foundation of the magazine is really, it's not our views, whether we're interviewing somebody controversial, a head of state of a, a, in, in an area, which might be, these are their words, these are their views. We're just trying to build awareness and understanding uh, and, and, and letting people decide for themselves uh, what those ideas are. So, you know, I go into an interview very much looking at what, are the key points that that person is interested in. I mean, every person, no matter what level they're at, no matter how successful they're at, whether they're a head of state or others, have certain things that matter to them. And it's my job to really touch on those, to put them at ease and to let them talk about that. That meet, for a business leader, that might be part of their business. That might be something relating to charity or a foundation they're involved in. That might be something around diversity and something they're doing there. Uh, it could be something on the environment or sustainability. It might be something personally that they're interested in. Whatever that is, uh, I'm really trying to put them at ease by letting them start in their comfort zone and really highlight the things that are of most importance to them. You know, I think the key reality of being or doing, in my mind, a good interview is the priority you put on listening. You know, many are very quick to want to ask their questions, cut in. I always go into these interviews, and this started probably when I started doing this at 21, 22 years old. I remember a CEO who said to me when they were talking about their management style, they said, you know, there's a reason why people are born with one mouth and two ears. And the reason is because you're supposed to listen first. And it stuck with me because this was someone I respected how they worked. And, you know, I always go into this with the notion of I'm here to learn as much as they are. And I'm really looking to listen, to feed off of what they say. My interviews generally will go from what I go in thinking to how they end up is very different. So I'm really open to let the conversation go where it's going to go. 
I do minimal research, to be honest. I, I research them, their company, but I'm more interested when I sit down almost in having no preconceived notions and finding out because these are people who have been written about often, who uh, it's not hard to find a lot of details on them. I like to go in for my own judgment, have a conversation. I really don't refer to it as an interview. I refer to it as a conversation um, because to me, it's a give and take pretty casual you know the, the best thing for me is after i did an interview when that person says i can't believe how easy that was because for me that meant that they were comfortable enough that that conversation let them go into things that they normally might not um and the comfort on the back end that you know rarely does an interview go where someone doesn't say i please don't publish that but and that's fine with me not to publish it but during the conversation, the fact that they're willing to say it shows me where they are in our relationship and their comfort, knowing that they can tell that. And then the other things that we talk about that I'm able to publish are much more open and much more transparent because we built that trust. So, you know, to me, trust is at the core of it. I think, you know, also really it's very important for those people to feel that they have the opportunity to really direct the conversation as much as they can. I'm going in knowing for my readership, this is what I want to get out of it. And these are the things I want that person to address. But I also want to find out what's important to them because many times in the interviews, things that I would never bring up, but that the other side is bringing up are things that I'll get the most feedback on because those are the things that they don't talk about much. Uh, and with social media today, with everything out there, it's very hard if you're interviewing the CEO of a Fortune 500 company or a head of state to find things that are not already out there. So unless you can really build the comfort and build the trust, are you gonna to get to a point where they are going to say to you, I've never really said this before. And that to me is what's important for me because my readers are that same level. I mean, we're distributed to CEOs, government leaders. So to find things that are gonna be new and different because nobody has any interest in reading an interview unless they're gonna either learn something from it, get an idea from it, or have a reason to reach out to that person, maybe to say, I read it and, 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 and to network. So my, my purpose and my role and the, the, frankly, the purpose of leaders is to be that vehicle to bring new, interesting, potentially opportunities to my readers and to be that bridge and facilitator between taking that interview and then making that interview into something that is going to get response. There's nothing more exciting for me when a CEO says, you can't believe the notes I've gotten from people I haven't seen in 15 years when they saw the interview. And, and also when others who know those people very well say to me, I never knew that about X or Y because they figured that they had already heard everything. So it really does come down to trust to me. It comes down to being open-minded and it comes down to listening because you know they all have something they want to say and they all have something that's important to them. It's a matter of finding out what that is. And that might be something that has to do with uh, a country that they visited that you didn't even think was going to be in that. It might have something to do with an experience one of their children had, but that takes you off to a whole nother area. Um, it might be just something that they did earlier in their career. You know, I've done many interviews with entrepreneurs who at this stage of their life, those who don't know them would think it was always an easy ride and how successful they are. And when you get into conversations with them about early in their career, when everything was potentially going to fall apart and they almost gave up on the idea that made them uh, successful and build a, a, a product or a company, that's the interesting stuff because uh, you, know, you really get to the heart of who the person is and you get to understand kind of what makes them tick, why they are the leader they are. Uh, because I've always been fascinated, which is why I've done this for so long on the concept of leadership and what makes somebody an effective leader and, and somebody not and why people follow certain people and 
are enthused and want to perform for them and why some don't and and leave companies and and, and they can't retain their people and you know I, I equated i played sports in college and i equated very much where you know you can have a coach or it could be a ceo who you either want to win for and you would run to a wall for and you would do anything for or you are not inspired and you don't perform and you look elsewhere so you know it it's challenging to find the former the leaders who really do inspire and engage and you know for me uh, you know there's those times when i meet for the first time a ceo and i leave the meeting and i think boy i, I wish i worked for that company and that to me is something it's an intangible you can't put your finger on it but there's something inspiring which a lot of time comes down to that company's purpose and whether it really is part of their culture and they live it uh, or if it's more of a PR vehicle and just something they talk about because every company today has a tagline that highlights what they do um, but not that many really live it every day and when you find those companies um, you know that's to me where you want to build your career so it's really around who is the leader how they drive it down and 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 really how they allow their people to grow how they provide opportunities and how you know, it's interesting to me around leadership, which, uh, you know, I've always been fascinated and frustrated by the fact that you know, many times people look at leaders based on uh, when things are going well, and there's a lot of visibility. I've always found that you really see who the leaders are when things are going really poorly. So during the financial crisis, during after 9-11, during the pandemic, that's when a lot of leaders aren't out there doing interviews and being visible. And that's the most important time I find that they need to be out there and they need to be talking about how you lead in challenging times. They need to be inspiring their people. And you really find out in those times by seeing who's out there, who's willing to be interviewed, who's willing to talk when things aren't great about what they're doing to adapt, how they're being innovative, what opportunities they see. Those are people who really, um, to me are leaders and, and, and kind of stand the test of time. So those are all the things I look for and I try to, to bring out in the interviews and, uh, and that's across all industry. You know, we're do, as, we, as we do more around purpose, we're doing um, really outside the box for leaders interviews. So we're doing um, more in the entertainment world for foundations. So we'll be publishing an interview coming up with LeBron James's foundation, or we just did Lady Gaga's foundation or Matt Damon around water and his water.org foundation. But it doesn't matter if it's a business leader, if it's a, a foundation leader, if it's someone in academia, someone in health, it's the same traits to me. It's, you know, bringing out in the interviews, how they think about leading people, how they grow people in their company, what advice they give to young people and, and, and around starting their careers and paying it back and really mentoring, which is so critical. Um, opportunities across diversity. You know, we do a women leaders section regularly, really trying to promote and push more opportunities for women in business, which has been an ongoing thing for us. And there's been progress, but it's a long way to go. And, uh, and, and so you know, for us, it's all of these points and, you know, really trying to shine a light on those that are not doing it because of something that happened, but doing it because they believe it. So while the past two to three, four years, I can do interviews with almost any CEO around diversity with what's happened in the country and some of the, 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 the tragic incidents. You know, there are CEOs who 15 years ago, when no one was talking about diversity, were talking about it. So those are, you know, that's again, those are leaders. The ones today who talk about community and needing to be engaged in your community are starting to do it. But then there's those that 10 or 15 years ago built their business around sharing profits with the community, being engaged, giving time off, doing charity day. So there's so many pieces to leadership. And for me, the interviews is really my responsibility is to shine a light on leaders that are doing it right. I'm not looking to criticize or to do anything. I'm asking the questions and I'm leaving it for my readers 
to decide, you know, who's kind of not only talking the talk, but walking the walk. And, and, and you can see that very quickly when you start to see who the leader is and how engaged they are in their companies, in those process projects. I mean, you know, a company can talk about a, a major emphasis around diversity and inclusion, but if the CEO is not leading that and heading that council within the company, it's probably not going to happen. It needs to be driven really at the top with the commitment, the resources, um, and the support. So, you know, those are all the things we touch on on interviews, um, and that's what we do. I, I would generally always, whether it be in person and be just being audio or taped, before I would start, I would definitely take five or 10 minutes with them to number one, feel out their comfort. Uh, two, to let them know uh, that in my case, it's a little different. You know, you have, there's a lot of journalism, which is about kind of the catch you moment and trying to get, so I'm in a little bit of a different position where I already have some of that trust because they know that my mission is to portray them and their words the way they want to portray them. So, you know, but I definitely go out of my way to before I do an interview to have, if it's somebody new, a decent amount of back and forth and build a relationship already. Because the reality is there's nothing worse than when you ask a first question and you believe it's going to be the meat of your interview and the interviewee says yes and stops. And if that's their only answer, you know you have a job to do to kind of pull out more and how you make them feel comfortable. And most of the time they're saying yes, because they're not comfortable. That's just, you know, I have many, many CEOs over the years who, when we, before we start the interview will tell me, I'm not, this is not something I'm good at. And it's right off the bat, they're asking me and, you know, they'll always say, please, you know, kind of make me sound okay. I'm trusting you. And that's my job to make them realize, number one, I'm not out there to attack i'm out there to inform and two you know that once you get them going that same person this happened not long ago who says yes it's amazing once again i hate the word interview because to me the notion of a discussion or a conversation is much more a back and forth where they are much more open to tell you things that they wouldn't always tell you so you know i think it's hard to build the trust. I think it also sometimes happens during the conversation. Many times the second half of my interview with somebody I don't know will be much better because that first half we felt each other out. I mean, it's a two-way process. While I'm interviewing them, they're definitely getting a read on me. And you know, the reason why many of those over 30 years I've interviewed 10, 12, 15 times, I think is because of that trust. And then it becomes finding new things to talk to them about new areas. But trust is hard, but that is the key. I mean, if you don't have the trust, you're either going to get a bad interview or you're not going to get them to really tell you what they feel. And I've seen it. I mean, I, ha I have over the years done interviews where it, we didn't have that right off the bat. And after the interview, when we turned off the recorder, they would say to me, let me tell you what I really think. And I would say, well, you know, do we trust each other now? Have we built that? And we'll go back and redo it because they didn't have that with me at first. They were just hesitant. And a lot of it in my world comes from the fact that most of the people I interview are so public through their life that they have usually, this is them talking, they have usually been taken out of context. So for me, if I do an interview that is long, so I mean, on my print side, I only have so many pages. So if I have an interview that could be 10 pages, but I'm only giving them three, that's where the trust comes because I'm deciding what to put in, what to cut, what's important. And most of these people feel in other different types of media, not good or bad, but you know, what's pulled out is what they think is going to draw more readers. 
I'm not interested in more readers. I've got a controlled circulation. You have to qualify. You have to be at a certain level. So I'm not trying to get all that visibility. I'm trying to get their peers to learn something new about them or to have a reason to do business with them or have an idea with them. So, uh, you know, that, that is the key to it though. And I, and I do find that most of them, uh, you know, the other thing for me is, and maybe I say this because I started doing it at 21, 22, now I'm old. Then I was interviewing people who were 30 or 40 years older than me. And when I walked in the room, there was a little, you know, especially in certain parts of the world where it was an age had a certain meaning, kind of who are you? And that really forced me to both prove myself, to get them to trust me and to believe that I belonged in the room with them. Um, and that has really been a key for me. But it also at that age, when I was interviewing people who would be on the front page of the paper or head of state, I had to change my mentality and realize at the end of the day, these are just people who, who many times, the, bit, the, more, the, the, more, the more notoriety and visible they are, the more problems that come from that. And they all have the same issues. They all have the same concerns. They're all dealing with maybe a child and something in school, you know, and you have to take out a little bit of that, uh, you know, kind of aura around some of these people and really make it a very human relationship and, 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 a, and a personal relationship. Because to me, even with my magazine, I built the magazine on the idea that those who are clients of mine, I, we don't look at each other's clients. We look at ourselves as friends. So I really believe if tomorrow I said, I'm going to change leaders and I'm going to build a new product with a new name, I would have the same clients because they're there because we trust each other. They know my focus is to provide value. There's no reason for anyone to sit down with anybody for an interview unless they are going to get some value out of it. It has to have some purpose for them. And, you know, the, the worst thing to do when you go to an interview is to waste someone's time. So for me, my job is for them to walk away and say, you know, that was worth the hour I spent with him. And if they do, they'll spend it with you over and over again. If they don't, that's the end of the relationship. So, you know, you have one chance. And I think really it starts, you know, I had a CEO who's very well respected, who you CDC knows well, because he's uh, one of the leaders in China US relations. And I'll never forget when he said to me, David, anyone who walks in my office for the first time, they have me for maybe a minute, maybe. If in that minute they interest me, they've got me. If they don't, they might stay here for 10 minutes, but I'm not even listening. I'm, I'm off to the next meeting. That first impression, being prepared, going in and knowing what you want to say. You know, so many people go into a meeting and they walk in and then they start to think about what they're going to say. And they're not prepared and they don't realize you've lost the person. And it's the same with an interview. If that first question isn't interesting to them, their mind is off. I mean, they, they, they've lost it. You have to find a way to bring them in. Now that can also be before you start the interview in doing the research to know something personal about them. You know, I've gone into interviews where I knew that they might've had a child who went to a similar school or played a similar sport. If I bring that up, they'll talk about that for 20 minutes because that's really important. They'll tell me stories. And once I start the interview and they're completely comfortable, and you'll see a completely different side. You know, it's amazing to me, people who I've interviewed, people tell me, boy, you know, they're so tough. That must have been hard. And I think they were the most personable you can imagine. But it's your job as an interviewer to make that happen. And, and most importantly, to, to, to be able to adapt and to quickly evolve and to know in your head, you know, I always go in an interview knowing if this goes south, some, if this is not great, I can turn to this and we can figure it out. But it's very hard to do that on the spot. And many times it depends if that person's having a good day. I mean, I've gone in interviews with very well-known CEOs who say, I have to tell you, I'm having a horrible day. I'm not excited to do this. And do you want to reschedule? And I say no, because it's my job to turn your day around and to figure it out. 
and to, and by the way, if you're in that place, I might get a better interview because, you know, sometimes they want to vent about something or, but that's fine. Knowing that I'm going to not use that against them and it's going to be positioned in a way. I mean, there are many times I do an interview where somebody says something and afterwards says, you can't publish that. Like either I'm not allowed to say it, we're in a quiet period or that the fact they know that that would never be published and it wouldn't ever go from me to anyone else. That is what builds the relationship. You know, so it's all about relationships. And to me, if you're going to do an interview for the, with somebody, I don't care if it's one interview, I never go in thinking to myself, this is not a person who 10 or 15 years from now will not be in my life. Every single person I meet when I interview, there's a reason I'm going to spend my time because I don't want to waste my time or theirs. And that is to build a relationship and who knows where it goes. That's why I'd say 50% of our interviews are CEOs saying, you need to interview so-and-so. Now, for me, it's great because they're doing the work for me. I mean, they're recommending people there, but that is building a, a network, building a relationship, being a convener, a facilitator. And that's what we want to do. So that's how I try. It's not, it doesn't always work, but you, you know, you do the best you can. There are some people who are just never going to be happy. I mean, that's just life, but you still try to get the best interview you can get out of them. I mean, I, th I think first you need to approach it from your side on, on being realistic about what they're willing to talk about. I mean, I, there are topics you know, in, in 07, 08, in the financial crisis, you know, I was interviewing CEOs who many people were blaming for the crisis and saying they were the, and I knew it was going to be tough to interviews. I knew if I went in with an idea of what, of, I needed to go in knowing they're only going to be willing to address so much and, and how much can, how can I get the most out of that? I mean, you have a lot of issues, which, you know, I have many who say to me, look, this, this issue might be off the table. For me, that's usually the issue that's the most interesting. So I have to find a way to turn that around and either phrase it in a way or position it in a way where I'm making them comfortable addressing it only to the point they can. And a lot of it, you know, it's like you said earlier, Abby, about you know, two-way street. You know, to me, it, part of the reason... I rarely go into an interview. I might, if I have days where I'm doing five interviews, I'm rarely going into any of those interviews with questions. I'm come in my head. I know what I want to ask first from there to me. It's everything is played off their answers because to me, again, the idea of a conversation is if I have a list of questions and I ask the first and they say something interesting that takes me off on a different angle for me to then go to my second question, it doesn't make sense. It's why I don't really like to do written interviews because if you have a written interview, it reads like a written interview. There's no personality that doesn't come out. So, you know, to me, I used to early on have six or eight questions I want to ask. Now I go in, I know what I want generally to talk about. I'll ask a question up front. That might even change based on the five minutes we're together before we start. But from there on, everything is I'm taking from something that person said. And the conversation might go, you know, I might do an issue that's focused around um, diversity and inclusion. And frankly, the interview might end up being about China. But if that first question is going to be around diversity and inclusion, and that CEO is going to talk about what they're doing, and by the way, something relating to a program that they might be putting into China, well, if that becomes the heart of it, number one, that's what they want to talk about, because that's why they brought it up. And two, that becomes interesting. So, you know, there are many times I might have a section or certain focuses and I have to almost create new sections because I didn't even know it was going to go there. Or it could be, you know, I remember doing an interview which was more around talent and, and retaining talent. And it became into a program they had around hiring military and autistic um young people really at that stage and what they were doing kind of around disabilities. It was a fascinating interview and many other companies said, we want to start to get involved in that too. 
but that wasn't my initial focus. So, you know, when something like that, when it's a topic, which you, especially for a survey, you know, to me, the, there is more of the way you position the questions for them to feel comfortable enough to answer them. Um, you know, whether you're doing it from a ABCD or whether you really want them to talk further, there are certain topics where that, it all comes down to making sure, um, you know, they're gonna be comfortable. It's, which is hard. I mean, that's one of those topics. <laughs> Any other questions or you want me just to, it's an easy crowd. <laughs> so let me see what else you have here. Yeah, well, let, let me just go into, you know, again, I think even on the backside now, it depends what you're doing interview for. I'm obviously doing it for publication or for online, but you know, I also go out of my way once I edit or once I clean up the interview to always, when I send it back, add on and to make sure I'm getting more out of it because you know, sometimes you have to take a moment to digest what they said, to think about it and to take kind of what, what needs to be expanded on. Uh, and everybody, again, the, the key is to any, I would go a step further and say, this isn't about interviews, this is about life. The key is in any relationship to take the time to listen and learn and study and research what matters to that person. And whether that's the person you're interviewing, whether that's, whether that's for me, my, my kids, whatever it is, generally the relationship is going to be more honest, transparent, and open and, and lead to better conversation, no matter what that conversation is for if there's an understanding that you both are looking for what is best for each of you. I'm looking for the best content I can get. They're looking for, to be presented in the most fair, honest, and, and best way they can be. If you start with those two, it's generally gonna work. And, and, and that is the key for me. It's finding that balance. Um, it's not always gonna happen. But that, that's what's most important. And, and the reality is it's also, you know, there are many people I've interviewed over 30 years who you know, many, not saying names, but, you know, <laughs> many would not be well received um, around the world, heads of state and others. It's not my job to judge them. Uh, my, it's my job to present. These are people who have a large following and who, are, are in leadership roles. It's my job to present their views and opinions to other leaders to judge and to feel. You know, it's a hard spot to be in sometimes because I always say like, it's, I really need to stay independent and keep my opinions out of it because, you know, if you're interviewing someone who's saying things which are completely untrue, maybe true to them, but untrue factually, it's hard sometimes to let it go, but that's for my readers to judge. I always give them an opportunity to say, you sure this is how you, you, know, you feel? And they might feel that way. Um, I can only do as much as I can to present them in the best light, to present the best content in the best light, and then to leave that for those to decide. Uh, you know, we're, not, we're not a publication or a brand that is about opinions, or judging or taking sides. We're about presenting information, content, and ideally driving dialogue. Because today, with where the world is, with the crises the world is facing, you know, we feel that the concept of leadership is more important than ever. And where are those leaders? Who are those leaders? Who's willing to stick up for what they believe? Um, that's getting harder and harder for us to find in government, which is so polarized that you know, it's either an interview on one side or the other. And we're really looking for those who are trying to drive change um, and are open to discussion because nothing's going to happen unless there's discussion. And that's, that's my, really that's my platform to be that guide. I generally will do a few things. First, I will try to tap in to, I will do research on two or three people who know that person. Now for me, with our brand, it's a little easier. It might be a board member if it's a company, it might be a client, it might be an executive within the company. Um, 
in past years, many times, I'm, I'm going back 15, 20 years, I was always shocked because many times I would reach out and have an initial conversation with the head of PR, the head of communications. And it, it became very frustrating to me to see many times that person who should know the most didn't really know much because they didn't have a lot of access to the CEO. So they had press releases, but they had stuff that I could find. I was looking for, you know, what is that kind of, what's their passion point? What do they really care about? So you really need to try that. I do the general research um, as much as possible. It's challenging sometimes because you don't know what, you know, it has to be credible and where you go for that, that, that. I'll look at past interviews they do, which is easy to do now because they're all over. Um, but my, my probably first focus is, are there those who know them? I always look for their, at their background, what school they went to, what they studied, just thinking, is there anything that we have in common that would be a link? So, you know, the fact that I played basketball in college, if they played a sport in college, especially if it's basketball, we start right away with that. And then he starts or she starts to tell me a story. Like I remember, you know, Ernst & Young, a big, a big accounting firm, they had a whole thing around women in sports and, and, and a whole research thing they did. You know, I was very engaged in that because it was interesting to me. So if it's interesting to them, it's going to want to make them engaged. If they're not interested, they're tuned out. And I've, and I've seen it on both sides. I've seen it, you know, my biggest job when I have an interview is when we sit down and they say, I only have 15 minutes. And an hour later, I did my job well if we're still talking. If 15 minutes later, they got up and said, I got to go. I didn't find what that is because they will stay if they're interested and they'll forget about time and they're just in the moment. You know, the number of CEOs who say to me, you know, I really just was in the moment with you. That's when you're going to have a good interview. Um, but, you know, a lot of that is, it, it's the research, but I think more so it's the interaction when you're with them. And that's not even an interview. That's in my meetings too. You know, it's, it's again, at, at the level of people I'm interviewing, these are all people who, they like to tell you their stories. I mean, they enjoy it. Once you get them going, and, and many times afterwards, they'll say to me, you know what, I never take time. I'm so busy. I don't take time to reflect. I don't take time to actually appreciate. This actually made me th like think about things I've done. And I always ask a question at the end to these people about, you know, do they enjoy the process? Because they're very, I put successful in quotes, because to me, they're successful financially and they're successful with power. But I always say to them, you know, are they successful like with significance or with meaning? or impact. And they always think about it. And, you know, I also want to make them think and, and, you know, ask them questions that they might say, you know what, I don't. And whenever I ask them, look, with all you've done with the impact you've had, the, so many people you've given opportunities to what you've done, do you enjoy the process? And it's always sad to me how many say I never take the time. And thank you for telling me that because I do need to, you know, I usually they do that at the end of their life, but if you don't enjoy the process, what fun is it? So, you know, that's the other thing. I'm, I'm going into a lot of these interviews trying to get them to think about something they might not have thought about. And then they will say to me, you know what? Because if, they, if I can do that, then they'll call me two weeks later and say, they'll tell me a story about something they just did. And then the relationship starts. I think it's like a sore spot to me because I get a lot of emails from people and, and it's a sore spot because many of those emails are people who are clients that don't even belong and they don't fit in leaders. And I, and I, I feel that these are PR firms that are doing a mass, they're just shooting it out and saying, if we can get 10, our client will be happy to me. It's, is it the right place? So, you know, I generally will look at a pitch if I feel it's customized to me. If somebody's taken the time to say, as opposed to doing a blanket email 
we have a person in town you need to meet or whatever who says you know if, if somebody email if a pr firm which happens rarely emails me and says you know all you have to do is go online you know we saw you did in, if it's a tech or digital transfer we saw you did this interview we have a client who's doing this it'll spark my attention if it's you know sometimes they'll say david sometimes it might just go into the email and, and by the way, sometimes it says a different name because they've got to change the name but anyway if i get it and it's a you know clearly a form that could go to me or 10 other publications that have a completely different readership completely different focus i tend to not be interested you know i want to know just like me it'd be like me going in on those five interviews i do on a given day and asking all five the same question i mean these are all different people even if they're in the same industry they all came up differently there's a reason they did this so you know to me to be successful it's to really take the time and it's extra work to number one say is this not only good for my client is this also good for the publication i mean if i got an email from pr firm that said not basically, you know, would you do this, but we're bringing you an opportunity. I mean, this is good for you. Forget for my client. Like you need to have this story in. I'd say, I wonder what this is, as opposed to many who will call me after and say, it really helps that you like, I'm, I, this will help us that you did this because it needs to fit for me. If I'm not, you know, and, and, and that could be somebody, look, my interest now is on emerging leaders and the next generation. Because I can interview the name CEOs we know 10 times. It's pretty much the same interview. I mean, I try to get something new, but something has to happen. So, you know, I love getting pitches that are kind of out of the box. But if I showed you 15 pitches from 15 different PR agencies, you would almost not even know, you couldn't even distinguish them. They're very similar. And, and the other thing that bothers me with the pitches you go on my website, you get my cell phone number. I think, call me. If you actually take the time to call me and I'll pick up and you say, listen, just hear me out. I'm going to probably have a dialogue with you that's going to let you sell it to me different than an email. You know, an email pitch is just very hard. Usually it's attached to, they have a book coming out or there's a, there's a reason they need promotion. They want promotion. That's not my job. My job is content. So you know, that's where I, I would love to see a little bit more of a partnership there. I do send out emails to PR, not to, to like, I'll send an email out to Richard Edelman and say to Richard, look, I'm doing something on this purpose. Who should I interview? But Richard's going to send me five names that I should interview. I mean, he's going to say who's right. He's not going to pitch me someone and say this one because he knows it's good for them as well and good for me. If you're going to put if I'm going to do a favor for a PR firm and put someone in who doesn't belong to me, I'm not really doing them a favor. You know, they look like they don't belong. If, you know, if they're coming out and saying, I did this once as a favor and the story became, you know, they had two employees. They didn't really know if they were going to make it. And I'm saying, you know, this, this isn't right for you. You know, you still have to have a story. So I think a lot of it is taking the time to really pinpoint and quality over quantity to me, which is, you know, my whole, the reason why we haven't really gone newsstand over the years, even paid subscription, because we get a lot of requests from senior executives who see it on a coffee table or see it in the CEO's office. And I really said, look, to me, it's about quality in the sense of saying, this is what we are. This is what our strength is and stick to it. It's a balance because I think a lot of the content we have is very interesting for the next generation who wants to or sees themselves as a CEO but you have to decide what you are. And I think a PR firm has to say, look, we have this client. Do they make sense? You know, I, I've had, I've had pitches, which are, which would be great for, you know, certain magazines make no sense in mind. And if they, I don't mind if they send them to me, but you have to make me feel it makes sense. The one thing I've never understood in companies mm -hmm. is how anybody can be a corporate PR person and not feel comfortable and have access to the CEO. I mean, I've sat, I've done so many interviews where the head of PR has sat in the interview who
who's been with the company 10 years and we walk out and the head of PR turns to me and says, that was fascinating. I learned so much. And I'm thinking, you should know everything. Now, I, I, I couldn't work in that, you know, if I didn't have access, if I was in that role to the CEO, because many of them, I think over the years, don't want to bother the CEO. They feel they're busy. But I say, you're doing a disservice. The more you prepare me and the more you're able to tell me what's really important to them, the better they're going to look and the better the content. So first, I think the relationship between comms or PR or marketing or brand, whatever you want to call it, and the CEO is critical. And to, you know, the best people I've seen in PR are the ones who have the confidence that they've, they, you know, every C, I could have eight people in a PR, in a PR uh, department within a company. I'm always fascinated when the CEO says, tells me only work with this one. And it might not be the director. It might be five down, but they respect that person and they built a relationship. And to me, it, it comes back down to the relationship of you need to know. So when I call a PR person and say, look, I'm coming over tomorrow to do an interview. Just let me know, you know, is there anything I should know? When they say, if it's a public company, well, did you see our annual report? And I'm saying the letter in the annual report, that means I could, that's boring. I mean, I, that's numb. I'm like, tell me like, what's their passion? What are they? And so, you know, to me, to be successful in that role, you need, and I've seen it, the ones who are successful when that CEO leaves and goes to another company, the first person they bring with them, their secretary and their head of, and their, their comms person, because they have the same thing I'm talking about with trust. They trust them. They know they're not, you know, and if you're, you know, the hardest thing for me is when I, I used to, in the old days, reach out to PR people first. And a lot of times I'd get a note, they're too busy. Now I knew in my head, you didn't even show it to them. You just, your answer is they're too busy because you're not comfortable to show it. Most of the time I would end up meeting that CEO and they'd say, why, am, why aren't I in leaders? And I said, I tried, I sent a note. And they say, don't send it to my PR, send it directly to me. They don't know what I want. Now that's a problem in leadership because they should be the one I send it to because they should know. But to me, unless that's a very open line, and an ability to convince, not forget CEO, convince whoever your responsibility is on, on getting that visibility, uh, whatever executive, unless there's a clear relationship and that person, PR person can go into that office and say, I know you're busy, but this is something you have to do. It's amazing to me how many times I publish, you know, we do a focus around the leaders of New York once a year. It's amazing to me how many times after that issue comes out, CEOs will call and say, I cannot believe that you didn't ask me to be in there. And I said, I sent a note over to your PR people. Now it's their job to figure out, you know, so I think that is critical. So, yeah, and, and that's my, but that's my recommendation. You know, I mean, I have three kids. They're not, they're younger still, but you know, that that's my recommendation to them in their job. If you don't, I don't care if it's PR or not. If you don't have, access to your boss or to who you, you might as well leave the company. I mean, if you can't find a mentor above that's going to guide you and provide opportunities, that's, you're not going anywhere. And it's not easy to find those people sometimes, but that's critical to being successful. And that's, look, what I'm doing, I, I would say to you, in many ways, I've been fortunate because while I'm a lean company and I really run my own show, I feel like I have countless numbers of mentors because I've built relationship with CEOs across industry who I call and say, I don't know, like, I, I don't know what to do with leaders. And I go over and meet with them and we just talk it out. But people within their own companies can't do that with them. And I'm saying, why? And I think a little bit is concern over, you know, you have to have the confidence to know your value, to feel uh, you know, my, my, my opinion matters because I'm doing what's best for that person. And you have to try it. I always say to people, what's the worst that happens if you try it and it doesn't work, you're probably not at the right place. You know, so you find out quicker than waiting five years and then leave it, you know, but, but, you know, and CEOs need to understand it because coming back to what I said earlier is 
when things are tough or there's a downturn or something, it's the easiest thing to do to say no visibility. Let's all just close it down. And that's when marketing gets cut and budgets get cut. And I've always said the ones who really get it, that's when you need it the most because your executives are looking and saying, where's, the, where's our leader? Like we need guidance. And there needs to be that person in communications or PR who is, you know, is the pulse of the company and is able to tell their executives, look, we need this now. We have a problem. You know, many executives are isolated. And unless they have that, you know, it, it's the same with CEOs, this is a little bit off being track, but who say to me, look, to be successful, I need to find at least one no person in my company. Because my whole leadership team, they're yes people. They don't want to tell me something I don't want to hear because it's not, my reaction is probably not going to be great, but I need the person who does that. It's like the truth teller, they call it, because I can't, they know what's happening. I can only know so much. I can't always walk through the full halls and go into the offices. And most times, if it's a problem, it can be handled quickly, easily, or it can be handled very much more difficultly a year later or six months later. The one thing that every executive I interview and work with tells me is they wish their people understood the number one thing they don't like is surprises. They can handle a problem, but they can't handle a surprise. And that's where I always tell executives or, or people at different levels of the company, you're not, it's going to come out eventually. You're better off the sooner you can handle it, the better. It never gets easier. And, and that's what I would say to PR people, you know, it, it, whether it be a PR firm that has a client, that's whatever it is, you know, that's why I tell people who work with me, I say, we can handle anything. We're, this, we're, not, this, we're not in the life and death business. We're not doing uh, brain surgery. We're publishing interviews, but I can't fix it if we don't know about it. And I think that's the key. Same with if I do an interview and a PR person is sitting in the interview and the PR person knows that I might not know something that shouldn't be in there, uh, tell me, like, you know, I, I need to know, I can't fix it unless I know. But well, the, the gap to me is more, they need to, they, they need to decide, I'm not saying they should be out there talking about China US relations right now. But um, if you're a bank of China, and during the pandemic, you worked with SL Green around that food first initiative, and you're supporting the community, you should be telling that story. That's not China US directly, but that's a Chinese company that is based in the US that is helping food insecurity during a pandemic. That's that that's not a that shouldn't be a controversial story. And that should make people step back and say, hey, here's a Chinese company that cares about the community. Which, by the way, most of your members are doing things in the community and are not telling that story where every US company is dying to tell their story because that's how they get talent. That's how they build clients. That's how they get retention. And I never understood that. I mean, when I look, I would actually, in my vantage point, think that your members have no interest in, in those programs because I don't know of them. But I have a feeling if you went one by one, they're all doing something. In the pandemic, especially, it might have been with, with PP. It might have been with whatever it is. And there's a way to tell that story that's not self-serving. There's a way to tell that story is this is good for business too. You know, there was a time when many CEOs wouldn't want to tell that story because it was patting themselves on the back. Now that's changed. Now they know this is going to affect my bottom line. If I don't do this, I'm never going to hire the next generation because that's the first question they're asking. What do you do in the community? Second, my people aren't going to stay here. I'm not going to build. And three, if my community isn't thriving, I got no business anyway. So, you know, this notion that we're only working for our shareholders, that's done. It's the community, it's the employees, and it's the shareholders. And if you don't focus on all three, and I would love to hear that story more, 
because there needs to be a way that US, US companies understand it because they're working with those Chinese companies. But broader, I don't think understand really how invested many of those companies are in their communities. They still think of them as Chinese companies that are just doing business here. They don't see them as part of the community. But I think it's finding out what is that story. I mean, it could be there's, there's tons of stories. You know, it could be just around talent and diversity if they're hiring across different segments. It could be around a signature program they're doing in the community. It could be around, uh, you know, a technology, you know, whether it be banking, e-banking or whatever. It could be on anything. I think there's a way to get away from China US conversation, but still build brand and brand loyalty and equity. Uh, you know, and if you don't, it's like everyone says, you can have the greatest idea. If nobody knows, it's not such a good idea. So you got to tell it. We have, we, we resisted for a while um, only because I think we felt a lot of our readers like, they like the feel, they like the gloss, they like to have it. Having said that, we do have a digital flip book now, which has been very well received because it feels like the magazine and, and you can kind of turn the pages. So that's, I'm in the process of really looking at more either video or podcasts only because of, of timeliness, you know? So if an opportunity comes up for me today that is timely, my next issue is July. So I'm probably not gonna do it. So I am looking at other forms to be able to take advantage of, you know, in the book, I'm really publishing interviews that are forward thinking because of my lead time and things that are, are looking at the future. Um, but I, I do wanna capture a little bit of those opportunities where you can get an exclusive interview uh, with a new head of a country or a CEO who just took office or whatever it be. Mm -hmm. um, and we're exploring that now, uh, probably through either partnerships, because again, I'm very focused on staying to our what I know. I mean, I think the key of being successful is know what you know and know what you don't know. <laughs> probably for me, no. Not that much. I mean, I'm, you know, very much I'm sitting like we are here, you know, it's a very casual format. So I don't think it would that much. I do think, I mean, depending on, you know, if it, look, if it's live, yes, maybe I, I would focus a little differently. The challenge for me with live is, again, I'm very focused on building comfort and, you know, there are many who sometimes go off a little bit on a tangent or say things they shouldn't. So I, I would, my preparation would definitely be different because I don't have that time built in to make sure that, you know, we're, we're molding it to the right way. Um, so that would be a focus for me, but you know, I'm not, my general focus of conversationally, because I find even on TV, the best interviews are those type of interviews. So that's where I lean towards. <laughs>